All right, now onto the good stuff. How should the F-16 fight this bad boy? Well, I'm glad that you asked. I'm glad you came here. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the channel. Ryan here, Neo, whatever you want to call me. Today, we're going to be breaking down the Su-57 versus the F-16. Why is this so important right now? Well, there's going to potentially be this scenario actually playing out over Russian and Ukrainian airspace as these two beasts might face each other, although unlikely. We're going to go into the details of the Su-57 first, and I'm going to break down the missiles of the Su-57, what kind of radar that thing's using, the engines, and then the radar cross-section. And at the very end of the video, I'm going to talk to you about the tactics that the F-16 should use, although unclassified. Obviously, you can't show the full playbook, but this will give you an idea of what the Ukrainian fighter pilots might start to think as they're building their tactics to go up against the Su-57 and other Russian jets. If you like the concept behind this video, let me know in the comments below other jets that you would like to see pinned up against the F-16 and I'll break those down from a fighter pilot perspective. I'll also break them down from a maneuverability perspective and a weapons loadout perspective. Should be a good time, should be fun. Glad you guys are here. Let's dive in. The Su-57, what is it? Well, I'm glad that you asked. The Su-57 is a multi-role aircraft. It's basically meant for air superiority, but it's been modified to be able to drop weapons as well. It actually dropped some bombs in Syria in 2018, kind of checking the box as, yeah, this is a multi-role aircraft, but it looks to me to be more of a long-range air interdiction interceptor, kind of like the J-20, which isn't meant to maneuver extremely as good as the Su-57 is. Su-57 definitely is more maneuverable with its thrust vectoring capability than the J-20, but it's kind of the same concept. It's this big missile truck that's supposed to go after high-value targets and focus on air superiority. And it's worth noting that India was actually a partner on the Su-57 with Russia. They're like, yeah, Russia, let's do this. And then last second, they pulled out. They probably pulled out because they ended up going with the Rafael. They ended up buying a European fighter. And the sellers of that were like, look, dude, if you end up buying the Su-57, you're dead to me. We're not going to save this Rafael. So that was most likely part of it. But also, it's worth noting that if you pull out of a big project like that after you've spent millions of dollars, you've probably seen that there's some issues with the engineering, with the delivery deliverability and what could actually be delivered by Sukhoi that they just weren't comfortable with so they ended up going with something that was a little more dependable. And before we go any further it's worth noting that there's probably four or five of these Su-57s that have actually been produced, probably three or four that can actually fly or less and then the rest are hangar queens where they kind of sit around and the hangar queen is an official fighter pilot term for jets that basically sit around and you walk in and rip parts off of them to keep a few of your shiny pennies a few of the uh, prized possession jets actually up there flying. So my assumption is there's probably three or four of these that at any given time could probably fly, maybe one that could definitely fly and the rest kind of there supporting that one to get it airborne for special events and things like that. All right, now that we've broken down the jet a little bit, remember stay to the very end because I'll talk to you about the Su-57 head to head with the F-16. But for right now, we're gonna talk about the K-77 missile. And when it comes to these jets, guys, a lot of that comes down to what are you carrying? You know, what kind of firepower do you have? What kind of guns are you rocking? That's one of the most important things, right? Because you can get a badass jet up there and be like, yeah, this thing's epic. This thing will rage. This thing will do great in air shows, awesome in dogfights. But then if the armament and the weapons aren't suitable for air to air combat, it's not going to work out well. Because at the end of the day, it's like two nights jousting. If you've ever heard me talk about air to air combat, that's the mindset I would go into it with. You gotta have a good joust. You gotta have something that can knock that other fighter pilot off their horse. And in this case, that joust, that Sukhoi, Russia, and the Su-57, and all the fighter pilots that are gonna fly it are banking on is the K-77 missile. The predecessor to that was the R-77, and I'm gonna get into some of the fundamentals of that right now. So again, the K-77 comes after the R-77, and it is supposed to be able to carry that thing internally. So Russia claims that the Su-57 can carry eight of the K-77 missiles and two short-range ones for a total of 10 missiles, which is a big claim. You never know if that's actually what it can do. And honestly, when I've seen this thing fire it, 
in some of the videos I've watched, it looks to me like it's being fired off of a pylon. My assumption is that the engineering is so difficult to get those bay doors to open, the G-forces you can actually pull with those doors open, and then getting that missile to eject properly. There's literally, literally massive offices in the US Air Force that just focus on ejecting a missile from an aircraft to get it away from the aircraft properly. So in Russia at Sukhoi, I'm sure they're having a lot of trouble with that, actually getting it to punch off the jet properly and then getting the rocket motor to have a delay and fire off of that delay. And that's why they've chosen to typically fire this thing off of a pylon from all the sources I've read, all the things I've seen. However, they, maybe they've by now gotten it to a point where they can launch it out of an internal bay, but uh, I haven't seen it. And then the Su-57 weapon bays are also deeper than those on the Raptor of the GA-20, at least so they claim, because they want it to be able to, in the future, carry smaller hypersonic ballistic missiles. And those are still in the prototype phase, but Russia's basically saying, look, we made this thing bigger because we want you to fear hypersonic missiles. And then it's reported that the K-77, this is according to sources in Russia, that it has a range of 193 kilometers, which is 119 miles. They say that's longer than the AIM-120, but it's shorter than the PL-15, which is a Chinese missile. And that Chinese missile can go out to 300 kilometers or 186 miles. They also claim that the K-77 has a 360 degree target detection area. So basically they say once you fire it, the radar that's built into this K-77 can track aircraft on its own and there's what they call a no escape zone after firing it. So there you go, there's the missile and now let's talk about the formidable engine and see if it is formidable at all and how it would compare to an F-16. Remember, we're gonna continue to get into the radar cross section after this and then how it would fight against the F-16. So stay at the end of the video for that. Okay, we're gonna quickly watch a video of a flyover of the Su-57. This is the sound of four Su-57s. So there's that distinctive whine that you can hear almost like a tornado siren coming in and then you hear the turbo fans kick in after. So to me it has a tornado siren sound and then it's followed up with the basic jet engine sound that I've heard from F-15Es, F-18s, and F-16s, but that distinctive sound at the beginning is definitely different. And who knows if that video was the Saturn Isadeli 30 engine, pretty sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that is the new engine that Sukhoi is claiming that they are putting on the Su-57, and it's the engine that was always designed for the Su-57. Here's some quick facts on that Saturn engine. It's a two-shaft low bypass afterburning turbofan, and the architecture of it is a three-stage fan driven by a single single stage low pressure turbine and five stage high pressure compressor. So fancy words for it's got a lot going on and it's got a lot of an ability to put out thrust. And the big thing is this engine allows for the thrust vectoring. It allows for that 3D thrust vectoring. And the important part about that is this thrust vectoring can actually move the aircraft in all three axes. That's why it's called 3D. So it can move it in pitch, which is up and down, it can move it in roll, which is left to right, and then it can move it in yaw, which is side to side. So when you combine all those different axes, you're playing 3D chess with thrust vectoring, and these engines allow that to happen. So I would see this as a perk, as a plus of the Su-57. All right, now we're getting to the good stuff, the radar cross section. We're gonna talk about how this thing would actually fare in a battle versus an F-16 and other aircraft. So it's worth saying that there's a lot of discussion now of will they upgrade the Su-57 to an actual stealth aircraft? <laughs> and that's kind of funny to me because you're essentially saying like, hey, can we change the entire structure, the entire airframe of this aircraft to actually make it stealth? So that basically just shows, and it's obvious from the radar cross section, even in the patents that Sukhoi has filed that this is not a true stealth aircraft. It's what I would call like a fourth generation, 4.2, 4.3, generation aircraft where it has essentially the same radar cross-section as a clean F-18. It has a little better radar cross-section than the F-16 with the Sukhoi Su-57 coming in at one meter squared and F-16 is somewhere around five meters squared. So when you put that together, the radar cross-section of the Su-57 is a little better than the F-16, but it's not anything that the F-16 has to worry about. So on the surface, it may look like the Sukhoi Su-57 is a VLO, a very low absorbable aircraft, but it really isn't. 
determined based on what we just talked about with the F-18 being essentially on the same playing field. But when it comes to the F-35 and the F-22, with the F-35, the radar cross-section of the F-35 is around a thousand times smaller than the Su-57, and the F-22 is around a hundred thousand times smaller than the Su-57. So this is not a true stealth aircraft. And when you look at the images of this, when you look at the front of this aircraft, you can really see the rivets, you can see the pitot tubes, you can see the AOA, the ice detector vanes, you can see just areas where it's not truly stealth. So it's like if Boeing came out and said, hey, the Silent Eagle or the F-15 we're gonna take it and we're gonna put weapons in internal bays, basically pods that are stealthier pods, and we're gonna call it a stealth aircraft. No, you, you're not gonna call it a stealth aircraft. You're gonna call it a aircraft with a smaller RCS, a smaller radar cross-section. And that's how I see the Su-57 versus like the Su-35 or Su-27, is it's essentially the same thing, it's just got a little smaller of a radar cross-section, which is why I call it a generation 4.2 aircraft. All right, now onto the good stuff. How should the F-16 fight this bad boy? Well, I'm glad that you asked. I'm glad you came here. So when it comes to beyond visual range, there's gonna be similar detection ranges from these different aircraft. So it's gonna come down to the radar proficiency of those flying the aircraft. So for Ukrainian fighter pilots, it's gonna be crucial for them to know how to really truly dig in and operate the radar. Because again, when it comes to fighter jets, it's about getting the best radar you can up to altitude and then operating that sensor. It's essentially like being a fighter pilot becomes second nature because you should be able to move that jet like it's your body and you're simultaneously running like an air traffic controller radar. Like air traffic control centers are sitting there watching that radar screen. Imagine doing that while you're pulling nine Gs, you're flying at 600 miles an hour. That's what a fighter pilot's gotta do. So it's really down to the fundamentals, the blocking and tackling, the free throws. How well can these Ukrainian fighter pilots operate this radar? They've gotta live, eat, breathe, and sleep this radar. And I'll tell you what, this was the most challenging thing for me in the F-15. May have taken me a while to figure that thing out, but eventually, once you get really good at running a radar, you're gonna see things kind of slow down on the scope and your mind basically slows them down. And it's like, I know what that is. I know what this is. I know what this does. And I'm able to move the cursors around more effectively. I'm able to basically be a surgeon up in the sky and then be a sniper after I'm a surgeon. So you're a fighter pilot, you're a surgeon, you're a sniper. That's exactly what these Ukrainian fighter pilots have to be in the mindset of. And failure is not an option. So that's beyond visual range. Let's talk within visual range. So basic fighter maneuvers. You get teeth to teeth, head to head, nose to nose, mano a mano, Su-57, F-16. What are we gonna do? All right, F-16 pilots, and they're gonna have their own tactics, right? This is just armchair quarterbacking, but both of these jets are gonna do what's called a one circle fight. That means they're gonna merge and they're gonna try to point at each other as fast as they humanly can. And again, if you've seen some of my, my previous videos, some of my dog fights, the F-16 is awesome for being aggressive. So right when you make that merge, if you pull nine Gs, point your nose, or even do a high off bore sight shot with an AIM-9X, you've got an incredible advantage to just get weapons off your jet as soon as possible. Now, these 257 pilots might not be as proficient, so they might not have the ability to get a weapon off quite as fast, especially if you have a high off bore sight AIM-9X coming off of an F-16. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to proficiency again. How many free throws have you shot? How many times have you done one circle fights? Well, these 257 pilots, I can guarantee you, they have not done a lot of them. But you can't bank on a pilot's inability to do that to win. You've gotta bank on your ability to execute tactics that take advantage of your opponent's weaknesses. So another weakness of the Su-57 is its rearward visibility. So if you can get clutter in the background, if you can disguise yourself, blue sky, blue ocean, basically put yourself in a position where that Su-57 pilot loses sight of you, lose sight, lose the fight. So that would be my two main tactics. One circle and then get that Su-57 pilot to lose sight on me and then put the children to bed and take care of business. So at the end of the day, Su-57, a formidable opponent but the F-16 definitely able to take this thing down if these Ukrainian fighter pilots are able to execute tactics properly, focus on the basics, the free throws, the blocking and tackling, and this should be an interesting way that this plays out. I'm excited for Ukraine to get the F-16, and I'm excited for the lessons that we'll learn from a Western perspective of putting this F-16 up against these Soviet jets. If you wanna see more of this, let me know in the comments below. And oh, by the way, check out my Patreon. Over there, I've got dog fights of the F-16 versus Russian jets. I will link to that in the description. Thanks so much for being here. The best compliment you can give me is just check out another video. I'll link to those over here. Thanks so much. See you in the next video. Have a great day.